Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Public Health Ontario Rounds on promoting Black excellence and evidence-based innovations in mental health. My name is Tahira Walji. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Senior Program Specialist Health Equity at Public Health Ontario, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's session. Before we begin today's session, I just wanted to start from a place of gratitude to be part of this conversation today with some brilliant speakers who I'm really excited to introduce you to shortly. I'm also grateful to be joining this conversation today from Treaty 13 covering Tecoronto, the traditional lands and territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inui, and Métis people from across Turtle Island. I'm so grateful to be able to work, learn, and unlearn today with you all. I also acknowledge my position as a settler and my commitments to reconciliation and building meaningful relationships. And this includes continuing to listen and be guided by our Indigenous communities, including the recommendations of Truth and Reconcil Reconciliation Commission. Today and every day, we also recognize the sacrifices, strengths, diversities, and innovations of Black communities who have been the leaders in developing and implementing action on anti-Black racism, and have been generous in sharing their leadership and expertise, including our speakers here today. We're so honored to be able to have this conversation to commemorate Black Mental Health Week 2024. This year's theme, Growth and Reflection, ties in with the final year of the UN International Decade for People of African Descent. Black Mental Health Week is an opportunity to bring awareness to the impacts and effects of systemic anti-Black racism on mental health and wellness, and importantly, to amplify the examples of meaningful collaborations with Black communities to co-design and co-implement culturally responsive and anti-racist mental health supports. As a South Asian cis woman working in public health, I humbly recognize my responsibility to continuously and actively learn and unlearn with humility. And I'm so grateful for our speakers to being here today. Before we begin, I'll mention a few housekeeping items. The chat pod has been disabled to limit any distractions during the presentation. Please use the Q&A pod if you have any questions throughout the session. A discussion and question period will follow the presentations, and at that point, please feel free to use the chat pod to share any thoughts, any reflections, any comments, as we'll open that up as well. If at any point you experience any technical issues throughout this session, please email capacitybuilding at oahpp.ca. Also, as the moderator of the session, I have no conflicts of interest to share. It's now my pleasure to introduce our three speakers for today's presentation, Akhil Noza, Dr. Chantel Phillips, and Kevin Haynes. Akhil Noza has an avid research interest in health equity and Black health program implementation. She holds an MSc Public Health from McGill University and an Honours BA in Health and Society from McMaster University. She's currently on the board of the Black Health Education Collaborative's Scientific Planning Committee for their Black Health Primer, a Canadian medical school's curriculum for introducing Black health inequalities and historical anti-Black racism in the medical field. Akhil sees community-led care, grassroots organizing, and a reconfiguration of public funds that prioritizes Black working class communities as integral to mental health care. Dr. Chantal Phillips is a first year medical resident in the family medicine stream of the public health and preventative medicine program at the University of Ottawa. She earned her doctor of medicine degree from the University of Toronto in June, 2023. She's worked as a project manager leading black community health and mental health projects for the past three years and is passionate about equitable and community driven health solutions with the overarching goal of increasing access to culturally responsive healthcare. Kevin Haynes is the Senior Manager Black Health Strategy for the Provincial System Support Program at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. He's responsible for leading the provincial expansion of the Substance Abuse Program for African Canadian and Caribbean Youth, SAPASI, 
the first ever Canadian hospital and community partnership focused on advancing care for Black youth. Kevin is also the co-chair of the Mental Health and Addictions Advisory Panel with the Toronto Police Services Board, where he provides leadership and makes recommendations to the board related to monitoring and evaluating the implementation of Toronto Police Services mental health and addiction strategy. If we were in person, this would be time for a huge round of applause for these amazing speakers that we have here with us today. Akhil and Chantel will be sharing findings from a rapid review on mental health services and programs with and for Black communities, which was led by both of them during their time as former students in the Health Promotion, Chronic Disease and Injury Prevention Department at PHO. This will be followed by some learning through practice examples from Kevin, who will share practice-based learnings from CAMH's SAPACY program. This will be followed by an interactive question and answer period with the audience. The learning objectives for today's session are to describe the ways anti-Black racism in Canada has translated to detrimental outcomes and harms, including differential mental health outcomes for Black communities, to discuss the diversity and characteristics of mental health services within four Black communities and to describe their leadership, strengths, and impacts in designing and implementing mental health programs and services. Lastly, we'll conclude with understanding some meaningful collaborations when co-designing and co-implementing anti-racist and responsive mental health supports. We have a wide range of folks joining us today, and so we'd love to learn a little bit about our audience, including what type of organization you're working with and what your role in public health and mental health more broadly is. So we're now going to launch our first poll, and we're hoping to understand which of the following best describes your role. So we have a, a wide range of roles here, ranging from mental health service providers, physicians, researchers, public health nurse, specialists, consultants, epidemiologists, community developers, health promoters, knowledge translators, policy analysts, and students. And if somehow um, one of your roles doesn't fit within those categories, there's also an other option. So it would be great to hear from you uh, what best describes your role. And uh, we'll now share the poll results. So it looks like the vast majority of folks are public health nurses at 22%, followed by physicians, mental health service providers and researchers, as well as epidemiologists. Oh, and I missed health promoters there. So looks like we're spanning a wide range of different roles here. And uh, our next poll is to understand what type of organization you're joining from today. So. Uh, whether that's academia or research institutions, government departments or authorities, service delivery organizations, including public health units, health centers, uh, non-governmental or community-based organizations, or other public health organizations. So if you can let us know by selecting the option that works best for you. And we'll now share the results of our poll. So it looks like most people are joining today from a public health organization, followed by a service delivery organization and government departments with some community-based organizations and research institutions here as well. So a wide range of different organizations. Thank you so much to our audience for providing with a little, providing us with a little more information about you. This is really helpful to guide our conversation today and um, help us frame the presentations. So with that, I'll pass it over to Akhil to start the session. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Tahira, for the great introduction regarding the research myself and Chantal have compiled and for our session today. Uh, to begin, there have been longstanding calls to prioritize the mental health of Black communities. Driven by the recognition of disparities in mental health care access, experience, and outcomes, as well as by evidence on the detrimental physical and mental impacts of living with anti-Black racism, also known as ABR, and systemic discrimination. Black populations in Canada wait twice as long for mental health care compared to their white counterparts and were more likely to self-report their mental health as fair or poor during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
ABR's impact on health can also be referred to as racial trauma and leaves lasting effects that contributes to the development of anxiety, depression, and PTSD as Black populations navigate their daily life with heightened caution, sentiments of imminent danger, and subsequently lower mood and affect. Since ABR encroaches on Black people's lives with regards to employment, income, and education, this limits Black populations' mental health resource accessibility through systemic barriers to care. In the face of these experiences, research has shown the effectiveness of rooting mental health supports for Black populations within Black leadership and community strengths, such as community connections, histories of resilience and resistance, Afrocentric values, and Black feminist principles. Engaging in program co-creation alongside Black community members and prioritizing grassroots approaches has been key on the implementation sciences front for breakthrough mental health outcomes. Taking this type of strengths-based approach is a pertinent strategy for centering Black experiences in mental health conversations and offers an important alternative to the deficit-based rhetoric that often excludes solutions or approaches that communities have already built. Deficit-based approaches fail to fuel existing mental health initiatives catalyzed by community members who recognize their needs well before health systems choose to include them in their policies. Additionally, there is a clear gap in the knowledge base with regards to what mental health programs are currently underway that are created specifically for Black communities. Failure but to better understand services that are already working for the benefit of Black mental health has left research in a liminal space wherein impact evaluation has not been done to our knowledge in a scoping manner for programming that exists in the mental health care space. The mental health services and programs with and for Black communities rapid review aim to share the ways that the health sector has taken an active role in, a, in, in providing services that meet the significant need for mental health services and programs for and with Black communities. To understand how these services align with the community's priorities, we also map out services to the five priorities to end disparities or the five priorities as identified in the Black Health Alliance report. It is important to acknowledge that while Black communities share many of the challenges and barriers rooted in multi-level racism, there is great diversity within those communities as well. In Canada, this diversity extends to language, ethnicity, ancestry, and culture. Rejecting the assumption of homogeneity is particularly important within the context of health equity and health planning for recognizing the limitations of a one-size-fits-all approach and the strength of consulting with communities to understand their needs. Co-creation of programming alongside community-based groups allows our planning to be effective in improving the mental health of those we work alongside. By accounting for multilingual resources and bringing on staff who are in touch with the community and who have a trusting rapport with community members, the range of Black experiences can be firmly addressed. Our aim was to review documents as mental health services for Black communities, and rather on mental health services for Black communities, and summarize their structures, service type, practices, and evaluations. We looked at two questions. What are the characteristics of current mental health services and programs focused on Black communities? And what are reported impacts of those services and programs? Our framework for the research conducted was drawn from Black Health Alliance's work, highlighting five priorities to end disparities, as we've stated. These five priorities are COVID-19 recovery and joint action on social determinants of health, community building and neighborhood renewal, health and social services infrastructure that meets the need of Black Torontonians, for this context we said Canadians or Ontarians, culturally responsive interventions and eliminating anti-Black racism in health and social services. The first priority can be linked to how the COVID-19 pandemic disproportionately impacted the mental health of Black populations and how health programs must work to rebuild community capacity that has been strained by the drastically affected health equity landscape. Community building and neighborhood renewal works to analyze the results for whether services work to strengthen community ties and belonging, especially in the face of neighborhood spaces 
for Black populations being at risk in the face of gentrification and other social factors. The third priority really looks into whether the needs of Black Canadians were addressed in the social safety nets that were analyzed. The priority of culturally sensitive interventions gave way to analysis that highlighted programming which incorporated cultural customs and norms into care provided to Black communities. And finally, eliminating anti-Black racism explored whether services took an anti-racist approach to care provision. Including these five priorities in our analysis allowed for a metric to be used to observe whether programming addressed community needs. This framework allowed for examination of how the programs effectively prioritized the mental health of Black communities and to explore if they pave the way for improved social service infrastructure. Ultimately, the performance of the programs long-term are linked to organizational efforts to eliminate anti-Black racism within the systems that their participants navigate within. The five priorities ensure that this standard is upheld amongst the services examined in this review. A rapid review was chosen as the methodology that facilitates responsiveness and feasibility the most and aligned best with the scope of our question. Rapid reviews simplify certain types, certain steps rather of the systematic review process and are much more timely methodology. Both published, so peer reviewed literature and gray literature were included in the search and was guided by consultations with library services at PHO and a health equity content specialist. Peer-reviewed literature searches were conducted on June 20th, 22nd, um, 20th, 2022, and looked at articles published between 2017 and 2022. Gray literature searches were conducted from June 20th to 21st, 2022, and updated November 5th to 10th, 2022. Three reviewers were involved in screening. Our inclusion and exclusion criteria focused on services that we found in the US and Canada that were comparable and applicable to our Ontario context. These were community led and or publicly funded services that were created directly for black populations. The review excluded black mental health discussions that had no implementation and or impact evaluation components. And the research also excluded sources that did not directly reference Black populations, so programs that only mentioned high-level terminology, such as racialized communities or people of color. We included 23 articles total after title and abstract screening and full text screening, 10 peer-reviewed results, and 13 grade literature results. And now on to Chantel for the main findings. Thank you so much, Akil. Um, so uh, it's important for us to kind of go over the main findings and uh, there were months and months that went into this study, but we'll do our best to try to convey what some of those main findings were and ensure to relay some of the uh, the key pillars that are related to the uh, five disparities uh, or five priorities to end disparities. So when looking at the 23 black focused programs that were included, the services provided often recognized that there were a variety of needs. And because of those variety of needs, a diversity of services would need to be provided. Examples of this include that when there was counseling available, many of these programs offered in-person as well as virtual uh, counseling opportunities. There were peer support groups that existed. Um, there were online databases that were to connect people with Black service providers and Black healthcare providers. And another example is mental health education that was available through social media platforms, as well as through one-on-one -on -one capacity building and mental health education. So there were a number of, of different ways that services were provided because of just how diverse those needs were. Along similar lines, there was a recognition that Black communities are not a monolith. When we look at some of the, um, the different communities that were being provided for or had care provided to, it wasn't just about race. There was an understanding that we needed to also attend to some of the other intersections that affect identity. So one of the, the most common groups that, were, that, that resources were tailored to were youth. Uh, and this also included women as well as members of the 2S LGBTQ plus community. So there was a lot of recognition on the need for intersectional care and not just care for black community, but care for black community that is diverse. Um, it's also important to recognize when thinking about 
the framework that we use, the five priorities to end disparities, that there was a different allocation of priority to each of these pillars, depending on the programs that we looked at. For example, around 43% of the programs most often focused on two of the five pillars. So they mainly focused or at least mentioned culturally responsive care, as well as community building. The, this was closely followed by infrastructure. And then after that was eliminating anti-Black racism. An important point is that one of the five pillars is uh, it, it's about COVID recovery, but the uh, time period with which we were collecting articles included articles even prior to the pandemic. And so there are articles that don't really mention the pandemic at all because they were prior to 2020. And for those who that, that were in existence after this may have not explicitly referenced COVID recovery. And so that's an important um, piece that we won't really be covering much of COVID recovery today. A lot of the emphasis of the results are focused on some of the other pillars. I also want to emphasize that even though a number of the sources that we used in the study did not explicitly reference that they were focusing on eliminating anti-Black racism, the fact that they were attentive to the needs of Black communities and also being cognizant of the fact that those needs were being disproportionately ignored and avoided and, and that services were not being tailored to them is an approach to addressing anti-Black racism. So even if they didn't get categorized under eliminating anti-Black racism, in, in part, all of these programs had approaches to addressing anti-Black racism. And so that needs to be acknowledged. So now we'll be transitioning to our discussion section of the paper, which we also further categorized based on the framework we use, the five priorities to end disparities. This is then further compartmentalized into practice and impact. Practice is, uh, is composed of examples of the specific Black-focused interventions that were noted. And then impact is based on the results of evaluations that were done on those Black-focused program interventions, noting that there were a number of, of sources that were included that may have not explicitly had evaluations for each of the pillars. Starting with culturally responsive care, the most commonly cited or categorized pillar, Culturally responsive care acknowledges how culture impacts health and then adapts to the needs of diverse patients. This, of course, includes the impacts of discrimination as well as anti-Black racism. So when we're talking about culture in the culturally responsive care, it has to include an acknowledgement of, of anti-Black racism. It's not just food, it's not just music, it's also what role is anti-Black racism and discrimination play in how um, Black folks navigate our healthcare system and our mental health care system. And there are a number of ways that these cited programs did this. One example is that they took pre-existing therapeutic models and they adapted them so that they were better fit for Black community members and participants. One example is CBT, a very common and evidence-based framework being adapted for, for Black women. There was also psychotherapy that was adjusted so that it would be more appropriate or at least more um, acceptable in the context of certain Black church and religious communities. So spirituality was considered an important point, uh, an important component of psychotherapy that was included in this case. Uh, and so um, there was also trauma-informed collaborative care that was considered, for especially for patients who have PTSD. And this was something that was thought of as being important in this case. The second intervention thought of that was categorized under culturally responsive care was the adaptation of services to be provided across various settings. When we think about some of the barriers that, that Black communities may be facing in terms of accessing mental health services, sometimes this includes access to transportation to get to these services um, or not being available or not having just access to it because of time. If they're at work and they're not able to actually attend the scheduled in-person groups, there needs to be some other adjustments so that these programs are accessible. And so this included uh, development of mental health apps that were focused on Black women, as well as specific to communities with HIV, there is the recognition that not only is there stigma related to mental health, there's also stigma related to HIV. And so if for people who wanted to be in group communities and for being provided group therapy, that option was available for one of the studies that were cited, 
But there was also the option of individual therapy for people who did not feel comfortable being in that group setting because of that, that known stigma. So there are a couple of ways that those adaptations were made to pre-existing programs to make them more culturally responsive. The impact of some of those adjustments included that there was enhanced trust in service providers that for the specifically the trauma-informed collaborative care approach that there was a decrease in reported PTSD symptoms and that for a number of the programs listed here, there was improved access to mental health care. Moving on to the next pillar, which is community and capacity building. When we say capacity building, we're referring to the development of skills as well as partnerships or relationships that support the advancement of Black mental health. The included services had a number of approaches to building partnerships and providing access to mental health education to Black communities. One of those ways was uh, an online mental health promotion program that was more focused on capacity building for individuals. When we say individual skills, we're talking about coping. So coping with anxiety, coping with depression, what are some of the tools you can give to an individual who's experiencing those symptoms so that they know how to, to manage them? And then also when they are in need of, of help, if they are in crisis, where do they go for that help? So that was what one program, the YB Men program provided those types of supports and that type of education. There was also more peer support training programs, such as the VTRAC lab, which was more focused on not just individuals, but how do you equip people with tools or skills to help those around them? So what does it look like for family members? What does it look like for colleagues to be able to recognize those signs in other people? Uh, and so as mentioned, the VTRAC lab took this approach as well as the Black Emotional Mental Health Collective or BEAM, which was identifying opportunities for workshops, as well as online resources to build those skills, that ability to recognize mental health needs. And then there's also the partnerships. So there are partnerships that were fostered between community and healthcare institutions. And a really powerful example of that was a study that identified the, the need for postpartum and maternal supports for Black women. And they often had their, their services available in hospital, but there was a challenge between connecting people in community who had mistrust of that hospital for, for valid reason. And they partnered with local beauty salons in order to provide access to that care. So they had trusted community members and quite prominent community members working with institutions so that that care would be made more available. So that was um, just another way in which community and capacity building happened, especially for institutions and for programs that otherwise may have not had the ability to do that work. Some of the documented impacts through evaluation of this were one, makes sense, increased knowledge of healing and mental health. This was for both individual people as well as for peers, for groups. The other impact was that there was increased peer support skills and improved mental health attitudes. So when talking about things like stigma, that education was able to address some of that stigma and improve beliefs or perceptions of mental health, which of course, ideally, and in this case was documented to make it easier for individuals to access that support through community. The last pillar that I'll talk about in this case, just because of the amount of literature that was focused on it, is infrastructure. So when we talk about infrastructure, we're referring to investments to support and, and investments of resources to support the execution of programs, but also the upscaling of programs that are working. We see that they're working. And it goes without saying programs need resourcing to work. If you don't have resourcing, you can't get a program off the ground. You need to be able to fund the people to 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 build the program, to execute the program, and then to keep it going. And it was extremely important, especially for Black services that are often under-resourced and un but have a lot of need. And so one example of that um, in this case was the expansion of Sapacy. And we have Kevin here who will be elaborating more on that, on that program. But there was a lot of financial investments that were made um, through the government of Ontario that allowed for the upscaling of that program to be to have eight sites across Ontario. So it goes from just helping youth in one location, so in Toronto, to having multiple sites across the city of Toronto, to then having multiple sites across the province, and that includes Hamilton, includes Ottawa, and he'll be able to talk more about that. But that financial investment was a key aspect of infrastructure that led to that upscaling of, of what we already knew was, was working. The second is, is leveraging technology. So there's going to be times where there isn't enough funding to expand 
uh, brick and mortar resources across different areas. But what you can do is provide access virtually. And one example of this is the Rites of Passage program that through um, less funding than you would have needed for a brick and mortar location, we're able to use existing funding to make programming available virtually across the, the city. So this is another example of, of ways that infrastructure through funding as well as technology can enhance access to mental health services for, for Black youth in this case. And there weren't really any evaluations documenting the impact of enhancing infrastructure and how that leads to improved Black mental health outcomes. But as mentioned, uh, we'll be able to talk more about what this program looks like in practice through Kevin's support. In terms of implications for practice, so I know we, we talked quite a bit about some of the actual resources and some of the pillars, but we wanted to be able to, to take everything we just talked about and make it applicable to you. I think the first thing we wanted to make sure that you take away from this presentation that is that it's important to take the lead from Black communities and collaborate to understand priorities. So when we talk about partnerships and capacity building, um, it means working with people on the ground who already have a good understanding of what those what those needs are and being willing to partner with them with humility, recognizing that like we know what we need. Black communities know what they need and they don't need to be told what they need, but the partnership can help establish resourcing and services to meet those needs. The second is culturally responsive care and that that care needs to be intersectional. So we can't just focus on on race, even though it's really important to, to ensure that that is an element of the programming that you're focusing on, because with culturally responsive care, we need to attend to anti-Black racism. But it also should be thinking about age, it should be thinking about gender, it should be thinking about sexual orientation, it should be thinking about immigration and, and migration status. Those are all factors. And that's those only a uh, tip of the iceberg of the different aspects of experience and identity that can impact how hard it can be for someone to access mental health services. So when we think about being culturally responsive to our care, we need to be thinking about the various identities and the diversity of the Black communities that we have in Toronto, but also across the, the country. Third is that it's essential for mental health efforts to address anti-Black racism and to do so on various levels. And this, as mentioned previously, there weren't a lot of studies that we put under that pillar of eliminating anti-Black racism, but there were ways that by addressing those needs, they addressed anti-Black racism, despite not explicitly mentioning it in their, in their papers. So one way of doing this is, of course, um, systemically through infrastructure and investment, which we talked about. This is also organizational. It means identifying are there opportunities to enhance and to support the Black staff that we have here. That's capacity building. And if we don't have opportunity or funding or even access to a pool of, of uh, Black healthcare providers, which we know there is a deficit of in our system, what does it look like to then provide the training needed to existing service providers, non-Black service providers, so that they are able to acknowledge what some of those needs may be and how they can adapt current practice to be more culturally responsive. So we're not only asking for there to be more Black healthcare providers, which there does need to be, we're also asking for those who are non-Black already in the system, already working with Black clients in mental health services, how can you adapt your practice and how can you build capacity or, or receive training so that your current practice is more responsive? And then the, the it's also important to think about community and engagement. And that's hard to do because there's already such limited capacity at Black nonprofits and organizations that are doing all of this work. But, it's, but thinking about what are some ways that your organization, that the system that you work in can be um, more willing to build those partnerships and not just partnerships for a label, but partnerships with a meaning. How can you partner with, with organizations in a way that furthers the work that they're doing and makes the work that you're doing more, more effective in, in serving and meeting the needs of, of Black clients for, for their mental health services? And then lastly is individual and personal levels. We talked about individuals, non-Black individuals providing care to, to Black youth and, and to Black people in mental health and the need for capacity building uh, to provide good care. But a part of providing that good care is also addressing your, your biases. You can't really provide culturally responsive care unless there's cultural humility. There needs to be the ability to assess internally, are there any biases, perceptions that you have that are limiting your ability to provide good care to Black clients in, in the mental health sector? And so thinking through that, I think all of these, these different levels, systemic, organizational, 
community-based as well as individual are all necessary in order to eliminate anti-Black racism. And each of them have their own role to play in making that happen. Lastly is structured evaluations. So in a lot of these programs, we noted that it's it's hard to fund evaluations. It's hard to have people such as epidemiologists as well as other researchers who are good at, at structuring evaluations for programming because sometimes there's so much attention on just getting the program off the ground and making it effective that there isn't as much time or resources available to then evaluate that same program because you're so focused on and these programs were focused on making it happen. But uh, it's important to think through how do we fund and support evaluations of these programs, one, to demonstrate if they're effective, and then from that demonstration of, of, of efficacy, upscaling the programs that we know are working, such as uh, occurred with, with SAFACI. And so we kind of need to think through how can we support organizations to evaluate these culturally responsive interventions, because it's really those evaluations and that demonstration of impact that leads to funding opportunities and that leads to upscaling and access to those programs. In terms of the limitations of our study, so uh, there, a lot of our, our studies were gray literature and we'll talk a bit more about that. And uh, But it's important to recognize that a lot of these programs as mentioned, don't have as much academic literature because there aren't as many evaluations on the programming. And we wanted to ensure that programs that are available both in Canada as well as in the US were highlighted and so that meant including gray literature, which has a limitation of not being peer reviewed uh, and us really just going off of the sources that were identified online. But it still was necessary to include because of the amazing work that was being done and the impact these programs are having. It's just, as mentioned, there needs to be more work done in that area so that evaluations are, are present and impact is documented. The second limitation is that the, the five priorities to end disparities framework from the Black Health Alliance is based on Black communities in Toronto and the GTA. It was a study that was done on, on a cohort from that location. And so when we're talking about all of Ontario, or perhaps even more broadly across Canada and then even the US, we're using a framework that, that did not uh, maybe account for some of those differences in the diversity that may exist in different communities across the country and then in America as well, um, but identified that many of those pillars were still relevant in the context of, of this study. And this is the couple pictures of the final products that is available on the Public Health Ontario website. And we can take a look at the rapid review yourself after this, this session. And if you uh, have any interest in the citation and, and just kind of understanding more about the, the paper and everyone who was involved in making this happen, that's also available in the authors list there. With that being said, I would love to transition to Kevin to talk a bit more about how we take what we've learned and how it's been applied to practice. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Phillips and Akhil for that informative presentation. I think that will uh, be a great segue to a practice-based example uh, that I'm hoping to share. So again, I'm, my name is Kevin Haynes. I'm the Senior Manager of Black Health Strategy with the Provincial System Support Program at CAMH. And one of the projects under our portfolio is the Substance Abuse Program for African Canadian and Caribbean Youth, or SAPACY for short. Before I actually segue into it, I also want to address one piece in terms of the name. I know oftentimes when we talk about SAPACY, a lot of folks feel like it's just a substance uh, use or a substance abuse program, uh, but it's actually both a mental health and substance use program. So could, whether they're occurring at the same time or what we might call a concurrent disorder, or occurring in isolation. Uh, and that change was made for various reasons, given uh, some of the mental health needs that we are noticing in Black communities. So I'll touch on that point a little bit more as I progress through some of the slides, but wanted to share that piece as well. So who are we first starting, kind of starting off? Uh, so as Dr. Phillips was mentioning, this program has existed for a long time in community. It was very much so rooted in community experiences. Uh, so it actually started in the community in the early 1990s. I believe the particular year was 1994. And it was really created in response to a, what folks were calling a mental health crisis that Black youth were experiencing. And very much so are still experiencing today. Uh, so of note, we were noting uh, this kind of revolving door between the criminal justice system uh, and Black youth. So Black youth having their needs not met in places like school, not met in places like a child protection uh, or child welfare system, unidentified mental health needs, uh, not being connected to assessment. So things just kind of being left untreated in the community. 
Uh, and then when we look at kind of other systemic factors like over policing in communities where there's a uh, high prevalence of black, uh, black youth, it increases interactions with the justice system. And then we have more black youth entering the justice system as an example. Again, in the in system, not having mental health care needs met and kind of creating this resolving door where folks are kind of being discharged from custody back into the community, not getting access to mental health care, uh, being picked up by the system again, uh, and it's this vicious cycle. Uh, sometimes when we think about some of these unmet needs, I, I often like to point to various systems. So if you think of our uh, criminal justice system, we see overrepresentation of young Black youth uh, in, in, in criminal justice uh, spaces. If we look at the uh, child welfare spaces, we can see overrepresentation of Black youth and Black families involved. Uh, when we look at education, we can see kind of an underrepresentation of, you know, Black youth accessing, you know, higher forms of education and overrepresentation of like disciplinary action taken in schools. So if we look at suspensions, expulsion rates, that sort of thing. Uh, a phrase that I sometimes like to use to help really remind us kind of what we're talking about. I often note that black youth are underrepresented in spaces where you would want to be represented and overrepresented in spaces where you wouldn't want to be. So if you think of all these systems, I invite everyone who's on the call to kind of think of some of these systems and think of the ones that you maybe wouldn't want to be interacting with on a regular basis. Those are often the spaces that Black youth are overrepresented in. And some of the other spaces when we look at education, employment, some of the other pieces that we know are protective factors, uh, not, not great access for Black youth. So that of course contributes to, to mental health concerns considering you know, broader social determinants of health. So in terms of this program, it's really grounded on some of those lived experiences of Black youth and families but with a mandate to provide care that's anti-racist, anti-oppressive and culturally responsive. We heard a lot about culturally responsive approaches uh, between uh, Akhil and Dr. Phillips' uh, portion of the presentation. Uh, one thing I always like to point out when we talk about culturally responsive, because I think sometimes there's words that we use somewhat interchangeably. You might hear culturally safe, culturally conscious, uh, culturally competent. I particularly like a culturally responsive uh, for, for many reasons. I think it's one all encompassing, but it also reminds us in language, it's responsive as a verb, as an action word, right? It's an active process to be responsive to the needs of black youth and those who are in front of you. It's not enough to just kind of stop at this place where we think we're being culturally safe. It's like, how do we actively respond to the person in front of us from this approach of you know, client and family-centered care, understanding that your client is a person of African Caribbean and or black descent. And what are the unique needs that this client or this family might have? And how are you responding to those needs, right? So I think that's where I like to ground this idea of culturally responsive care in, which includes pieces uh, like being culturally safe, which includes this cultural humility that Dr. Phillips was mentioning, understanding that we are not the experts in everyone's culture. They are their experts, right? So we have to give them voice and give space to hear and learn from them as to what, uh, what uh, is supportive. So coming in from this place of not knowing all the answers uh, and partnering with our families to, to deliver uh, the best care. Uh, so of note in the late 1990s, SAPACY uh, moved to CAMH for more clinical and administrative support. Again, noting some of those factors that I, I touched on in terms of this revolving door really noting that the acuity of mental health concerns for Black youth was uh, very prevalent. And folks uh, at the time who were involved with the program felt that kind of being connected with like an academic hospital such as CAMH, uh, which stands for the Center for Addiction and Mental Health for folks who are maybe joining in other parts of the province and, and unfamiliar. Uh, connecting with an academic health sciences center such as CAMH could really strengthen some of the clinical approaches uh, to the program. So that's kind of where things landed from there. In terms of what we do, uh, we provide uh, mental health care for youth, again, who self-identify as African, Canadian, Caribbean, and or Black. Um, it's strictly based on how folks self-identify. Um, I always like to uh, remind folks that we're not checking people's race at the door. Uh, it's a very inclusive program. We've often served uh, many youth in the program who actually don't even identify as African, Canadian, uh, Caribbean and or Black. And what we do sometimes in those cases is really support those youth in connecting and supporting and making referrals to other services that might be a better fit for a more longitudinal care. Uh, but it's a there's a no wrong door approach for us. We don't close the door at anyone's face, but we're also very intentional in creating some of the spaces that create the safety and this cultural responsive care approaches for Black youth. Understanding that many youth 
don't have access to this type of care in other spaces. And uh, many youth, this is their first time interacting with the mental health system and often are quite ambivalent for some of the reasons that we talked about from some of the structural and systemic oppression. Uh, when we talk about youth, uh, we're defining youth as 12 to 29. Um, the background, I'm not, it's not about me, so I won't get into my whole uh, spiel there, but uh, being a formal clinician in the program, uh, when we first started, uh, we were on paper serving youth from 14 to 24. But uh, quite early, we noted that uh, the mental health care needs of youth and younger children were quite prevalent and evident. Uh, so, and of course, we know a lot of the literature about early intervention approaches and really wanted to meet youth and, and families uh, earlier to, to provide care. Uh, we're always trying to push the envelope to, to provide care as soon as possible on that younger age. But we also noted, particularly for some of the older youth, who some might call transitional age youth, uh, that we're often reaching them quite late because of many factors, this apprehension of kind of accessing mental health care, this distrust of the service or the system rather uh, more broadly. Oftentimes we were reaching youth at their 24th, 25th birthday. And we noted, you know, by the time we actually reached them and started to engage them in the process of receiving care, they were aging out of the system. So kind of taking a step back to say, can we extend that age range so we can support in bridging uh, for longitudinal care, particularly with folks with chronic mental health concerns that might require uh, more longitudinal care. Like how do we better partner with the system and bridge, uh, bridge the gap? So an analogy I like to use so that we're not walking folks to the edge of a cliff, right? And then where they get to that edge and then services drop off. How do we make those connections and those referrals uh, to support uh, long-term mental health uh, care needs for the youth? Uh, we talk about representation and care. Representation is a really big piece, a core element of our, our program. All of our providers have lived experience of, of members of diverse Black communities. And we're very intentional with this because we know from a lot of literature, uh, representation matters. Uh, but I would even go further than saying representation matters. And I would, I would push us to kind of get into this place where we understand that representation is a healthcare intervention. Uh, there's direct links and there's statistics that show that increasing representation uh, directly is correlated uh, with improved outcomes. Um, just that in itself, let alone the aspects of providing culturally responsive care. Uh, but that's noted for many reasons, quite notably because it creates a safer space for youth to talk about some of their the impacts of anti-Black racism and oppression in the system understanding that those things also have implications on their mental health. So it's really kind of taking this holistic systems level approach, understanding that you know we're not individualizing per se a, a young person's mental health concerns. Of course, there are certain things that are specific to the individual, but also understanding how does the system uh, play into uh, contributing and exacerbating some of, those, um, some of those pieces as well. Won't spend too much time on this slide because we heard some of the, the great literature uh, from uh, my co-presenters, uh, but there was this great uh, snapshot that I like to reference from the Mental Health Commission of Canada, uh, kind of really taking a deeper dive at some of the, the mental health care needs of Black Canadian residents. And quite notably, one of the stats that I often like to point out is that in those surveys, 60% of folks surveyed noted that they'd be more receptive to using mental health services uh, if their provider uh, identified as Black. Again, really highlighting the importance of representation and care. We can see quite uh, the underutilization of mental health services with Black Canadian residents throughout those periods of the survey. And overwhelmingly, nearly everybody felt that this was an issue that needed to be addressed. So really highlighting that this is a known, a known uh, need in the community. Uh, and it's about partnering with community and resourcing programs to, to help meet these communities' needs. So taking a little deeper dive and looking more inward, what do we actually provide? So we provide individual counseling and psychotherapy, we provide group counseling, we provide psychiatric care and consultation, very comprehensive assessment and treatment planning, health promotion, a lot of work, you know, reaching out in schools and, and spaces where we know that black youth are at and really speaking to the importance of uh, accessing mental health care and, you know, being connected with primary care because we know sometimes primary care, for example, is a, a gateway to accessing mental health care services. Uh, we provide short-term case management to really understand what some of the needs are of the youth and families that we're working with and help connect them with other systems and services that are supportive. And then uh, last but not least, caregiver support, because we know that that's integral to ensuring long-term success and outcomes. 
when I know all these services, I, I mean, I'm sure many folks on the call might look at this and say, okay, well, we're doing these things too, which is great. I mean, we can't do it all by ourselves, uh, but it's also noting our approach to how we deliver these pieces, right? So these are kind of names of services that I think folks might be familiar with, but it's about how do we apply this culturally responsive lens to some of these pieces? So if I give an example, when we look at assessment, uh, or a particular individual assessment. I think sometimes in mainstream systems, we think of that as a point in time where it's like you come on the first day and whatever you tell us goes into your assessment. And now you've had an assessment and we move on to the next steps. But we work from this culturally responsive lens to really understand our youth and understand that many of them have had negative experiences with the healthcare system previously. They might not be in a place to share some of the intimate details of their experiences at that first point. So we kind of treat these assessments as an ongoing process until we build that rapport with the youth, until they get to a place where they're able to share uh, kind of a, a broader picture of what's going on for them. And at that point, considering that we've completed an assessment. When we think of like individual counseling and psychotherapy, it's not necessarily within the walls of you know, the ivory towers of you know, some of these uh, larger institutions. Sometimes that might mean we do a walking session where we walk with the youth in the park and talk about some of these pieces, you know, of course, confidentiality and, and uh, permitting, uh, depending on uh, how busy it is and how good the weather. Uh, but thinking of different approaches of how can we engage folks where they're at? Can we meet folks in communities, at coffee shops, uh, sometimes in their home uh, where, where that's appropriate to really break down those barriers and really understand like, look, it doesn't have to be this big scary process to access mental health care. Um, many folks comment that I never knew that this is what therapy was like. I, I always thought it was some type of scary process. So really kind of destigmatizing some of those approaches as well. So just to name, uh, just to name a few. Uh, so uh, Dr. Phillips noted our provincial expansion. We were very fortunate uh, through tremendous community advocacy uh, to receive funding to expand and scale these services. Uh, so this is where we're currently at with our hospital-based site uh, at CAMH or the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, and seven community satellite sites across the province, as far east as Ottawa and as far west as Windsor. Uh, also very notably, we've received notification um, from the Ministry of Health that we will be funded to expand to two additional satellite sites uh, within the next fiscal year. So we're really excited about that and, and also uh, partnering with community to really support and development of some of that site selection criteria. Again, this work doesn't happen magically or, or behind closed doors. There's this great team that we call our Backbone Partnership, uh, which is kind of a simpler phrase for other folks who are maybe more familiar with technical terms, which functions as an intermediary organization, essentially supporting these organizations and collaborat collaborating. So this kind of this collective impact approach uh, to systems change, understanding that uh, we need to work towards alignment, we need to work towards like a shared vision, uh, our shared evaluation and data strategy, strategies, uh, many different components, uh, health promotion, knowledge mobilization, you name it. So uh, there's three components to this backbone partnership. It's our team, which is through the provincial system support program at CAMH. Uh, very close partnership with the Black Health Alliance, could not do this work without their support uh, and their leadership in community spaces as well. And we, we try, try to treat this partnership in the true sense of the word partnership. So it's, you know, shared decision making and trying to keep a horizontal plane. Uh, and when we think of kind of CAMH kind of receiving some of this funding to kind of spread and scale the service, I often challenge us to think, you know, how do we lead from behind, right? We don't have to be at the forefront of every table. We don't have to be kind of planting the CAMH flag in every space that we're in. It's like, how do we lead from behind and support community? Uh, because community has the expertise, right? And it's like, if we're doing a great job, folks don't even need to really know what we're doing in the background because the work is going to speak for itself. And then, of course, the Office of Health Equity at CAMH, which has led tremendous advocacy efforts to support us in receiving this funding. Uh, every player here uh, plays a different role at different times. Uh, so we, we lean on the expertise of our collective partnership to support with advancing the work as we as we go forward. Uh, again, when we talk about partnerships, it's not in isolation. We also partner with youth. Uh, so through processes, but we, for folks who are familiar with kind of like participatory action research, uh, we've convened the Provincial Black Youth Advisory Panel. 
uh, tremendous uh, reach uh, to this program. I think we had, you know, hundreds of you throughout the province expressing interest in, in joining. Uh, couldn't possibly have a panel of over 100 uh, youth, so we had to do the hard work of narrowing that down, but also keeping those broader folks engaged in, in more of an online network to continue those conversations. Uh, but this group, uh, it's a tremendous group with a, a lot of brilliant youth between the, the ages of 12 to 29, and they provide guidance on uh, everything from program design, implementation, evaluation, knowledge mobilization, and kind of like our strategic direction. So of note, one of the pieces that we're looking on, working on now is our rebranding, uh, our rebranding process, and the youth have taken a very active role in terms of um, you know selecting kind of where we might land in terms of a new name, a new logo, a new logo a feel, co-developing a website. Uh, so hopefully in the near future, we'll be able to share kind of where we are uh, with some of those pieces. And lastly, uh, to kind of speak to some of these intersectional approaches, we understand that, you know, even though we're providing great care, we have to create better pathways. So I'm just highlighting an example of a partnership that we, uh, that we have um, formed with the Ministry of the Attorney General, uh, particularly with their Justice Centers initiative uh, to create this better pathway to care for Black youth. So again, understanding this revolving door between the criminal justice system and unmet mental health needs. Uh, we created this partnership uh, with, the, with the Justice Centre in Toronto, so the Toronto Northwest Justice Centre, uh, which is essentially a, a, a model of care that co-locates a mental health services uh, with uh, front-end supports like primary care, restorative justice programming, uh, prevention services, you know, employment skills training, uh, and it moves kind of this idea of court from outside of uh, the traditional walls of a court into a community setting uh, so that youth are provided with the care that they need while they're kind of resolving some of their charges that they might have faced. But it also connects them with more longitudinal mental health care in spaces that some of these youth have never had access. So our partnership involves creating streamlined access to our program, SAPACY, for, for participants of this center. Uh, but also uh, completing mental health assessments for the court. So what some folks might be uh, familiar with what they call Section 34 assessments. So really speaking to some of those mitigating factors of what, what, what might be contributing to this youth's involvement in the justice system. And again, it's not from a, a place of um, kind of, you know, disregarding some of the, the individual uh, circumstances of what's going on, but it's also understanding this mental health need is unmet. Uh, we to be equitable, everybody deserves access to mental health care, no matter what type of situation they find themselves in. So how do we provide some of that care and support and assessment? And also understanding that in doing that, we, we, we might also reduce some recidivism rates for our youth and, and uh, have better uh, population health outcomes. So on that note, I will pass it back to, I guess, our moderators who might support with question and answer. Uh, thank everyone for spending your lunch hour with us and we're here to answer questions if there are any. Great, a huge, huge thank you to Dr. Phillips, Akhil and Kevin for sharing their insights and practice-based examples. This has been a really innovative and interesting hour and I think we're ready for some Q&A as you mentioned, Kevin. So uh, just to our audience, please feel free to continue entering your questions into the Q&A pod. We've also now opened up the chat pod if you'd like to just share any reflections or thoughts or keep the conversation going. And so uh, we've already started to get some questions in the Q&A pod, so I will start there. And the first question I think uh, we'll start with here is around the rapid review itself. So this question would be for Chantel and Akhil. Did you come across any literature on the impact of funding uh, African, Caribbean, and or Black organizations to provide mental health services. And so maybe we can start with Chantel and then we'll pass it over to Akhil. Sure. So as mentioned, I think one of the challenges that was that particularly under the infrastructure pillar of the framework, which would have included financial supports for these types of programs, there wasn't really an evaluation of how the funding of that program perhaps increased access to resources and then as a result of that improved black mental health outcomes. So there isn't really that clear link that's been made. And that wasn't that we didn't come across that while we were going through the literature. But I guess aside from the rapid review, there is some literature. Um, there's a foundation of, of black communities, I think that was uh, that had did a, a huge report on the lack of, of philanthropy towards black community organizations, many of which 
nonprofit organizations provide and partner around mental health services. So even if we haven't demonstrated how funding positively impacts health outcomes, I think there is definitely a lot of data to show there's not enough funding, and that's in the context of disparities. So instead of waiting for data to show us that funding is useful, it makes more sense to, to fund those resources, like provide those resources, and then as a result of that, document health outcomes as a result of improved supports. So it doesn't exist yet, but I don't think a lack of data should stop us from making those investments because we already know there's a significantly disproportionately lower uh, in terms of access to resources as it pertains to funding. Yeah, um, Chantal really expanded on that pretty well, but um, as she said, I feel like the literature didn't necessarily demonstrate um, positive impact. However, um, in terms of capacity, capacity building overall, when it comes to um, healthcare provision, funding is usually affiliated with an increase in service provision overall and improved outcomes. So um, from there, I think that what Chantel said about that not stopping us is definitely a big factor for why there should be a push for funding regardless, because there will be that expansion in specialized care. Thank you both. Kevin, is there anything you might want to add to that question? Yeah, for the one thing, I, I think my colleagues uh, touched on it uh, quite perfectly. Uh, one thing I would maybe add also is to understand uh, that we know that there's you know disparities in access, uh, and we know that funding creates more uh, avenues for access, right? So I think understanding that in itself, we know there's I mean, and I guess you know research will kind of tell the tale, uh, but there we can assume, I think, that there might be a direct correlation between funding services and creating, you know, more opportunities for access to those services. And as Dr. Phillips mentioned, there's opportunity to then study what's actually happening and what the impact of those dollars has been. So not necessarily looking at that as a, as a barrier to say we can't start because we don't know where. I, I think we have enough literature to know that we, we do know where to start. Uh, but of course, to be res fiscally responsible, we should also show the impact of some of those investments as well. So it's not to say funding things without also funding evaluation, uh, but I think there's a, a, a lot of uh, signs that point us in a direction to start. Thank you so much. And I think that's a really good point that the three of you made around, you know, there's different forms of data. There's so much information that is out there that exists. So how can we leverage that to, to move things forward? So our next question is around more of a standards-based solution. And so the question is, what are some of the key elements in a standards-based solution that could help guide healthcare providers in providing culturally responsive, intersectional, and effective services across Canada for Black mental health? And I think uh, all of you have touched a little bit on this in, in your presentations, but maybe we can start with a Cleal on this question, and then we can pass on to Kevin and then Chantel. Yes, I believe a key factor with that would need to be having a framework and of collaboration with organizations that already directly work with Black communities. So I think that community consultation is an integral part um, to building a standards framework and ultimately having an effective impl implementation plan. So I think that in terms of what ends up uh, having an unveiling for said program on the ground is clearly determined by the populace that you are implementing that care for. Uh, so that would be a key factor. Um, and I think that Chantel and Kevin can speak more to that as Chantel is a, a healthcare provider and Kevin with SAPACI has uh, in-depth knowledge, but um, from what I know on the research end, that's definitely what the literature is showing. Thank you, Akil. I'll kind of jump in. I, I'll give a, a concrete example of you know, an action that I think that we can explore that might be supportive. Again, it's not necessarily that everywhere we go that we're going to expect teams like such as the program that we highlighted, 
um, it's a it's all of us need to support uh, better outcomes for for black youth right so in, where there might be specialty programs in certain areas of the province uh, part of our mandate isn't just to deliver the best care that we can in the program and of course that's a huge part of it uh, but we also want to support in building systems capacity because we know we can't do it alone and we also don't want to do it alone right there's many great service providers out there there's many uh, other areas of the healthcare system that we know our youth are going to interact with you know, emergency departments being one of them, right? So it's like, how do we actually build capacity to provide care in the ways, learning from the best practices that we're, we're, we're learning through practice. So one concrete example I would give is just even understanding like the type of training and capacity building uh, that's provided in understanding, you know, anti-Black racism uh, and culturally responsive methods of care. I think that's a very concrete and tangible thing uh, that organizations can consider in terms of, you know, your frontline staff or your clinicians, how are you supporting them in understanding the impacts and the implications of um, unaddressed, you know, racial trauma, um, kind of some of these broader social determinants of health and how they uniquely impact Black communities in ways that, I mean, sometimes other communities might not experience to the same degree. And I think that's something that can be implemented as a standard in the sense of saying, like, we deliver programs, you know, we're of course going to reach towards representation and care as much as possible. But I think across the board, uh, we can commit to increased capacity building and training and partnering with communities uh, to deliver some of those trainings, right? Because we know Oftentimes, you know, this evidence got from research to practice, I'm sure many folks understand that. By the time we make our, our lovely e-learning modules with all the bells and whistles, uh, the context has changed, right? So it's about how do we really partner with community and listen to community, right? Uh, community knows their needs. Uh, again, of course, we, we're, we're really pushing evidence-based practices, but we also have to understand you know, what communities have access to the resources to generate that evidence, right? So understanding evidence-based practices are important, but what about evidence-informed practices as well, right? And what about like also participatory processes where we partner with communities to co-create what that content should be, uh, understanding that those who are most impacted by these concerns understand what it is and their experiences are valid, right? Like whether the research has caught up uh, to also show that we don't necessarily have to wait for that to validate uh, community's experiences. So that would be my answer. And over mm -hmm. to you, Dr. Phillips. And I, it's, it's interesting because I recently uh, provided presentation on this, but at the Black Physicians Association of Ontario, their annual health symposium. And I think it, especially if you're a physician, nurse practitioner, social worker directly providing counseling services, there are already a number of frameworks that we've been taught and that those frameworks just perhaps haven't been inclusive of Black youth, Black communities in terms of their assessment and validation. So uh, it's, e it's much easier to adapt or um, something that you're already using in practice to make it more responsive than taking on an entirely new framework because it's much less likely that you are going to actually apply it. And one example that I've I've seen in practice already, and I'm only a PGY1 in my first year, but already I've seen some of the ways that that these adjustments can be useful is that when we think about like pediatric assessments, so whether it's a, it's a youth and adolescent, we, we have this framework called HEADS. So we think about some of the social factors that contribute to the well-being of youth, and that includes their mental health. So that's home environment, um, activities, drugs, alcohol, et cetera. And we have suicide as one of the S's in that framework. But what I found interesting in clinic, working with, with Black youth, as I have an interest in mental health and working with adolescents, is nowhere on that framework do we have a mention of some of the other factors that affect how Black youth navigate the world, which is identity and discrimination. So when you think about Black youth in a time of, of life and adolescence where identity formation is so critical, why aren't we talking about and asking about blackness and how they view their blackness or how they view ethnicity and how are they navigating that in a culture where they're facing a number of barriers that are actually preventing them or almost like scolding them for being black. Like we live in an anti-black society that would otherwise apply a lot of pressures onto them in the midst of what would already be a challenging period of their lives. So um, I think when you think about the HEADS framework, if you're already asking some of these questions in practice as a family doctor, as a pediatrician, as a social worker, et cetera, consider adjusting some of those social questions to include questions about how do you view yourself? Like what, how, how do you define yourself? What is your racial identity or ethnic identity? And how, how do you navigate the world in this identity? And do you feel comfortable in your blackness? 
And then after that, asking based on whatever identifier they, they choose, whether it be Black or Nigerian or Jamaican, whatever it may be, do you feel people treat you differently because you are insert? And so this is already just like an adaptation of an existing model we use. It's just instead of um, heads, there's just two more Ds, the identity and the discrimination. So um, I'm hoping to validate that tool. Uh, we'll see what happens. But I think that we should think about how do you address what you're already doing to be more inclusive of some of the other barriers and challenges that, that Black youth and otherwise Black people are facing in mental health. Thank you so much. Great to hear the practice-based examples from Chantel and Kevin, and then Akhil, that research piece tying it all together. That's super helpful. We have a, a question now around uh, health promotion in particular. And Kevin, you talked a little bit about health promotion as a tactic and as a technique to uh, consider when implementing SAPACY, but expanding that beyond just health promotion in general. So. Do you have any insights to share with health promotion practitioners, um, any strategies or tactics to consider when developing or planning health promotion type interventions and programs for youth and young adults? So Kevin, did you wanna start with that one? Sure, and I can give an example of a, a program that we're currently working on now. It's a PHAC funded initiative where we're developing smoking cessation uh, programs for Black communities, I think starting in the greater Toronto area, but hopefully, you know, if we're successful in some future competitions, maybe spreading and scaling that to other spaces as well. Uh, you know, it really starts with partnering with community and also partnering with people with lived experience, right? So really understanding uh, you know, those variance in literacy rates uh, and health literacy as well, understanding that, you know, some of these information that we're trying to promote uh, is new. Um, and trying to avoid using jargon um, and using language that's reflective of what community uses. So I think these are some of the strategies that we often talk about. But I think, you know, when I think about this partner, this uh, project that we worked on specifically, or we're currently even working on, it's really about thinking about our health promotion strategy, like where are the communities that we're looking to reach and kind of shifting that mindset versus of how do we get them to come to us versus how do we go to where they're ready or at. So we talked about kind of promoting some of these spaces in like barbershops and hair salons, uh, you know, running, you know, ra uh, radio ads for folks who are uh, engaging and listening, maybe some of the older communities listening to radios, um, some, you know, newspapers and in, in, I mean, younger people listen to radios too. So please don't uh, take me, uh, it wasn't uh, pointing for anyone there. Uh, also running uh, ads in print, right, for folks who are maybe looking at things in print that aren't in social media uh, spaces. So really thinking about like, where are these avenues for access? Um, partnering with communities to co-develop and co-create some of that content. So for this uh, project thing for in particular, we partnered with Black communities and uh, Black individuals with lived experience of trying to make uh, smoking uh, quit attempts to understand like, what were some of the barriers of care for you? Uh, understanding that it's not just kind of what we read sometimes, but it was about some of these pieces that Dr. Phillips mentioned in terms of like the social stigma, uh, understanding that in their communities, you know, there might have been this really enhanced stigma of what it means to be someone who smokes, um, understanding cultural differences, right? So when we think of some and religious differences, right? In some religious contexts, uh, this is an activity that they should not be doing and kind of grappling between this identity of, you know, identify as this type of person, uh, from this type of cultural background, uh, but it's not in line with my my use, and I'm struggling with that, right? So, you know, that in itself sometimes can be a barrier to accessing care because not wanting to even, you know, be on the record to say, yes, I'm, I'm doing this activity and I know I shouldn't be uh, based on my cultural values, right? So, like, when we think of some of those health promotion materials, those could, that could be a lens that we could be targeting, you know, particularly subpopulations of communities that uh, sometimes we overlook some of those pieces and we get right to the facts and the evidence, which is important, but also understanding, you know, there's many barriers that are a different, uh, that are differently experienced by different Black communities. And how do we actually reach out to those communities and, and get their voices at the table so that we can uh, better create, you know, longer, uh, better health promotion strategies. But I think also the last piece, I know I'm kind of a, uh, stress for time here that's here but the last piece I would say too is how do we do things that are sustainable right because I think sometimes what we talk about health promotion campaigns and strategies we think about coming into a community 
doing something and then leaving, but it's like, it takes time and years to build trust with community, right? So it's about how do I form relationships with community before I have a health promotion campaign that I'm looking to launch so that if and when that time comes, I already have established relationships. I'm a trusted member with these communities. The community looks at me as someone who's embedded and invested in it. Uh, and that they'd be much more receptive to kind of supporting uh, and really breaking down some of those barriers. So those would be some examples that I would I'd share. Thank you so much, Kevin. Chantel, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? And then we can pass to Aquil. Nope, I think it was perfect. Yeah, um, I guess to speak to um, some key portions of the health promotion plans that are in place overall. Um, I think that a logic model um, is a key portion as to why um, when it, uh, implementation actually occurs, there may not there may be a gap in the long-term goals of the projects underway. So when creating a health promotion program for Black youth, there needs to be an acknowledgement of the disempowerment at play amongst youth, um, especially given that within the institutions that they navigate through, um, there are constant barriers to uh, a positive self-image based on their race. And there needs to be an active component within our logic models that aim to dismantle anti-Black racism and internalize racism that these um, young, um, young adults young children may face on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think that models that include a didactic format, um, kind of talking at them and not with them, ends up leaving them with the same type of feeling that they would feel in you know, a given lecture or um, classroom. I think having a facilitation dynamic that's much more cohesive and open to conversation and uh, allows for community to be built along with vulnerability makes for an effective program that um, allows them to come from a strengths-based approach. Uh, so I feel that um, along with what Kevin said of kind of including the communities on board, I think um, upholding community values that are already carried across whether a program is implemented in a school, in a healthcare environment, wherever it may be, it's important to really integrate uh, these values of uh, community cohesion. Thank you so much, Akhil. I think we have time for two more questions. It's great to have some extra time for this conversation. Um, so kind of building off of that question on health promotion, what do you envision the role is of public health as a key partner in this space? And can you elaborate on that based on your experience in practice or, or based on what you've learned in the research? So maybe let's start with Chantel. Sure, the first thought that comes to mind, even though there are an, a number of ways that public health can of course contribute. And uh, I'm very excited to be in public health and preventive medicine and to do that same work. But something that was a limitation of our study that we're emphasizing is evaluation and how key epidemiology is to effective public health units. And what does it look like for us to partner, perhaps with in-kind support from public health units on some of these same evaluations? Because these are some of the programs, like let's say in this case, Sapasi, it literally is, spans the province. There are hundreds, if not maybe thousands of youth who are participating in, this, in these programs. And it's doing a lot of the work that perhaps might have not been addressed um, or acknowledged by numbers. We don't, other, other than the actual nonprofits who are doing that work and documenting that, if we don't partner with public health units and or other bodies that are experts in, in that epidemiology and, and research methods, unfortunately, I think the impact of that programming, especially in municipal contexts, will be missed. So how do we partner and have that in-kind support from epidemiology and from some of the departments who you know, are masters in that, in that area so that we don't miss the, the power of some of these programs because we don't have the resources to document it in an academic way? Because we have the, it seems like the impact on the ground, but without the academic capital, it, it doesn't matter. And I know that's very strong and perhaps even controversial to say, but I do think being in, in, I get to see both community as well as academic contexts 
And without those peer reviewed articles and without the, the numbers of the evaluations, it's much harder to justify the upscaling of these types of interventions. So I really, I, I hope and, and want to be a strong proponent of public health units identifying opportunities to partner with community in this research based way. I also want to shout out um, the Ottawa Public Health Unit because they, in 2020, did an Ottawa um, Black community report on mental health and partnered directly with community and did that exact same thing. They used some of the epidemiology supports that they had on board at the unit and brought attention to that issue. And I think that's just one example of what it could look like for other municipalities in the province to think about partnering with Black communities in that way. Thank you, Chantal. Akhil, over to you. Yeah, I think that a key portion of what public health will be doing um, moving forward would be systems coordination. So having public health units allocate resources across Black mental health sites, really building up that personnel base, and ultimately standardizing procedures as well so that we can ultimately build a province-wide framework for anti-Black racism, um, combating anti-Black racism in our intake procedures in multiple steps of the care provision process. Uh, Kevin, over to you. Yeah, in short, I, I would echo everything uh, my colleague said, but I think also like opportunities like this, right? Like knowledge mobilization is huge. Uh, how do we create the spaces where, you know, Black communities are empowered to kind of share some of these practice-based examples and some of these evidence and the findings that were uh, in real time. So I think that's one. To go back to the uh, example that we gave earlier in terms of health promotion, uh, we, I speak for myself and I think all of us on the call, we would certainly be open to supporting and partnering with uh, public health units and developing health promotion campaigns and materials and kind of lending some of the expertise that we're seeing on the ground uh, to support um, some of those initiatives. Again, we can't do it all by ourselves, right? And not to suggest we are, uh, but also not to suggest that we want to, right? It's about collaboration and partnership. So it's like, how do we partner with communities and organizations who are doing some of the great work uh, and how do we connect those conversations so we're not like in silos trying to accomplish the same thing? Like how do we leverage each other's expertise uh, to, to make a greater impact? That's what I'd say. I'd say those are really amazing actions and things that people can really think about integrating right away into, into the work that they're doing and, and pushing for that uh, as much as they can. Um, a couple of SAPACY specific questions. So uh, one clarification question around SAPACY. Uh, is SAPACY inclusive of providing services to Indo-Caribbean youth or is it specifically to Black youth who identify as from African and or Caribbean Canadian descent? And also uh, do providers that work in the SAPACY program identify as African and or Caribbean Canadian descent? Would they have to? Yeah, so those are great questions. I think in terms of um, the Indo-Caribbean populations, we certainly do see uh, youth uh, who identify from those communities as well. I sometimes like to frame it as, you know, this is a program for any youth who feels like this is a program for them. Uh, so however they identify, if they identify with one of those communities and they feel kind of connected to kind of the philosophy of care and our approaches to care, um, we certainly uh, do and have seen uh, youth from some of those communities, uh, as well as part of our, you know, our backbone uh, team, we definitely have representation from those communities in our, you know, project management uh, team as well. Um, so uh, in short, yes. And the other piece in terms of um, the, the model of care. So we're very purposeful in wanting to increase representation and care for many of the reasons that we talked about. So uh, yes, we are very purposeful uh, in uh, leveraging the expertise of clinicians uh, with lived experiences of, of being members of diverse African Caribbean and or black communities. That's not to say that we don't partner with the broader organization, right? So if I think of the example of our SAPC team at the CAMH, which is a mental health hospital, it's a small team uh, co-located in a larger hospital. There's lots of opportunity for partnership with other specialized services and other specialized programs. Uh, so we're not, so to speak, depriving youth of you know the expertise of the broader hospital, but it's also, you know, they know that they have a team of folks who really understand some of those cultural nuances. And also like, as we kind of leverage that team, how do we serve in more of like a consultative liaison 
pro, like way for the broader hospital and other teams in helping to support building uh, that capacity. So really predicting the, you know, the small in the grand scheme of healthcare intervention, the small pot of resources that we have to really drive increased representation in care and partnering with the broader system. Uh, we need allies everywhere. Uh, so we certainly invite the, the broader healthcare teams uh, with other members who maybe don't identify with those communities that we certainly would love to partner because uh, we could use everybody's support. Thanks so much, Kevin. So one uh, one more question around SAPACY, and it's a little bit related to the expansion. So Kevin and the SAPACY team, congratulations on this expansion. This is a huge, huge win. And to hear more about those two additional sites is great. Um, so just around this expansion, are there any sites north of Steeles being considered? So that's uh, for our GTA folks. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we've heard lots of interest from community members in many regions uh, throughout the province uh, that there's great appetite and need for programs like SAPSI. So we think of spaces like York Region, I guess that being north of Steeles. I mean, if, if we want to go way north of Steeles, we've even heard from folks in some of the northern Ontario spaces that uh, there's growing populations of Black communities in some of those spaces as well. So certainly there's no shortage of need across the province. Um, you know, noting that we're going to be adding two sites, um, this hopefully is not the end all and be all, uh, and maybe we end up going back to the province with a, a short list of more than two, uh, because there's just such tremendous need and kind of seeing where we get from that. But uh, we've certainly heard from folks, uh, particularly, I think, to ask, answer the question specifically in York region that there's a uh, great need. So it's definitely something on our radar. That's great news, and I'm sure everyone will be uh, eagerly awaiting to hear more about those two expansions, so we'll definitely keep an eye out. Um, it looks like that's it for the questions that we have today. So we will be wrapping up today's session, and before I do that, I just wanted to extend a huge thank you to Dr. Chantel Phillips, to Phil Noza, and to Kevin Haynes for presenting, for sharing their insights and their experiences and really wanted to thank the audience for participating, for sharing those questions and for joining today. You can expect to receive a brief and anonymous PHO round survey for today's session. So please try to complete this to help us improve our programming. Let us know what you'd like to hear more of and more about. And as a reminder to everyone, the topic convention, so the Ontario Public Health Convention will be held on March 26th and April 3rd of this year. Registration is open and feel free to check out topic.ca for more details. Lastly, to access past presentations and to view confirmed and upcoming sessions, please visit the PHO website, head to education and events and click on presentations. Thank you so much for your time today and wishing everyone a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.